class number 20, the special class number 20. How about we talk about behavior models? So we're talking about engineering design, which is fantastic, but an engineering design isn't necessarily a static piece of paper that just lays there. In theory, your design should actually do something. That doing of something is actually a behavior. So if you do your design correctly, you will specify something that does something, which is fantastic. And because you know what your design does, you could go around and you could tell people what your design does, which is fantastic. But there's only so many hours in the day, you probably couldn't get to everybody who wanted to know something about your design. So it sounds like it would be worthwhile for you to document your design. A lot of different ways to do that, right? Now I know you guys are all masters of the English language, and that nothing fills your heart with more joy than writing word after word describing your engineering design. And I'm sure that if you handed it off to somebody, somebody would really enjoy reading the potentially voluminous description of your design, but that doesn't really seem like it would be the most efficient way of doing it. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Let's figure out what we can do with your design so that you can communicate it to the largest number of people and they can understand what you're talking about. Sound like a reasonable way to spend a few moments? All right. All right, so let's talk about models. Sadly, we will not be talking about America's Next Top Model. Instead, we're going to be talking about engineering models, specifically, okay? So where are we? Well, we've got an initial design, right? You had a concept. You've evaluated your concept. You've picked one. You've said, this is the one that I want to run with. This is the best idea that I've had, which is a great thing to do. Now, what's interesting is, is that your, your initial design we really refer to it as being an abstraction. We call it an abstraction because it's not actually a physical realization of whatever you're designing, right? You've specified a blue widget. You've specified a stopwatch. You've specified a cell phone. Congratulations. But it's not really a cell phone. It's not really a stopwatch. It's not really a power adapter supply or plasma, plasma torch cutter or what have you. Okay? What you've done is all you've done is you've specified it. So we're going to call that an abstraction. Now, if you want to tell people about your design, you're going to have to document it. You're going to have to use some sort of agreed documentation technique. You know, if it's using Roman numerals and if it's writing it in Greek, fantastic. Then go ahead and <laughs> figure out how to do that. Okay? Good news, it's not. But when you take your abstraction, your design, you actually standardize, use a standardized uh, language or model. What pops out at the other end is a model. Basically, it is your design that you've described in a way that you can hand off to somebody and they'll understand what you're talking about. That sounds like a good thing. Now, a modeling language actually doesn't have to be formed from letters and words. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. More often than not, because of conciseness, they're made out of uh, graphical symbols of some sort. Now, you already know a whole bunch of modeling languages. So let's take a look and see what ones you know. Um, I guess one would be a blueprint. Right? So if you want to have a house built, you decide you want to have a house that has four bedrooms and three bathrooms. Oof, you're going to get a blueprint. Now, is that actually a house with four bedrooms and three bathrooms? No. That's some scratches on a blue pieces of paper, right? Basically. Right? And if you don't like where the bathrooms are, can you move them around? You certainly can. And when you look at a room, can you tell how big that room is going to be? They did a good job on their blueprint, right? And you can say, I would like to knock down that wall. I'd like to make that a bigger room or divide that up or what have you. So basically, a blueprint is simply a model for documenting a design for a house. You've seen that a bunch of times. Another example would be a football play. John Madden is no longer doing it anymore, but you remember what he used to do on TV, right? He'd use all the X's and O's to show you the play. Exactly, right? Remember, this is what football players seem to be able to understand. You are the O, you go here, et cetera, et cetera, that type of deal. So it's a very, very effective way to communicate. Now, could you write out a football play using words? You sure could, right? Can you imagine just how horrible that would be to memorize? <laughs> I got lost in third paragraph, Coach. I'm not quite sure what happened there. All right, what else do we have here? One of your personal favorites, electrical schematics. You've either, either encountered them already or you're going to encounter them this semester, next semester, as you go forward. Remember, a schematic is fabulous, it's wonderful, but it's not actually a circuit, is it? Right? It's a plan for a circuit. It's an abstraction. It's a model. What's sort of cool about it, though, 
is that we've got enough computer software these days that if you can define it using a schematic, you can actually do what? You can simulate it, you can test it, you can find out if it's got flaws long before you actually build the darn thing. I think I got one more here. What do we got? Oh, mathematical formula. Boop, there you go. Right? Very concise way of expressing something, right? You could do that in words, but dear God in heaven, nobody really actually want to read it, right? All right. So that's the whole concept. That's what we're talking about today. Models. Just a, a way to concisely talk about this fantastic design that you've come up. And uh, good news for you, there's a zillion different ways to do this. Is there one particular way that's the best way? Absolutely not. You need to take a look at every design that you work on and figure out what works best for it. Okay? All right, so the first one we're going to talk about is state diagrams. You guys have probably encountered these before. State diagrams are fantastic. We use them a lot, okay? They're actually designed for one very specific type of model, and it's a model that actually has a memory, right? So if I have a system that has a memory, and based on that memory it's going to take an action and do or not do something, then a state diagram is a great way to communicate that to somebody, okay? There's only four symbols used in a state diagram, so you really cannot get a lot simpler than this. There's, of course, states, and you hop from state to state <coughs> using transitions, okay, basically just arrows, okay? And there's an initial state, because you've got to start someplace, and there's a final state, because you've got to end up someplace. You've got those four down, and you're taken care of, right? You can create any state diagram you want. Which is great, and it's a lot of fun to talk about this, but how about if we actually take a look at one and see how these things work? Here we go. All right, it's candy machine time, because early in the morning, there's nothing you enjoy talking about more than a candy machine. All right, so if you give me 25 cents, I will give you a piece of candy. It's the promise of this particular candy machine, okay? It accepts only nickels and dimes. Oddly enough, no quarters. What's that? Are you laughing at my candy machine? Is there something wrong? No, it's it's stupid. This was a problem. <laughs> Yeah. You had another one. Oh, this was the problem. Yeah. This was the problem. So you know the answer. No. So there is no answer. So that's, yeah, that's right there. Everybody goes into that. Just shot. All right. So, so the concept behind the candy machine is, is basically, you know, yeah, if you had a quarter, poof, that's it. But if I'm going to allow you to put in nickels and dimes, the thing has to have memory, right? Because I have to remember, you put in some money, and you're putting in more money. And if I own the darn machine, I don't want to give you candy until you've actually given me 25 cents, right? So therein lies the challenge. I've got a memory issue here. Okay, so I can model the state machine uh, because with a uh, state machine because the response of the machine to a coin depends on how much money is already been put in. There's actually three types of transitions in this. Okay, one is a dime transition, one is a nickel transition, and one is this thing that we call an unconditional transition from the bottom going up to the top. All right, so let's see how this would work. I mean, it's pretty straightforward, but if I had, uh, let's see, is it, uh, I think it's like uh, t -t 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 three nickels and uh, one dime, I think is what I was thinking. Okay, so I put a nickel in, boop, start here, nickel, I go to here, yay, five cents. Put another nickel in, boop, 10 cents. If I put my dime in, whee, go down to here, I'm at 20 cents. If I put my last nickel in, I go to the last state right here. Now, nine you, after you put your 25 cents in, the system resets. It goes back to zero. Um, we're going to assume that it's going to remain in this state long enough to take an action. And what's the action that it needs to take after I've gone through the effort of putting all my nickels and dimes in? Give me my candy, right? Darn straight. Now, there's a fundamental flaw with this state machine. Can anybody tell me what it is? No change. <laughs> hey, thanks for that 30 cents. I'll be keeping it now, won't I? Right? So you can, you can just imagine, you know, like in a, in a real machine, like this one, this state machine must get sort of crazy, right? Feed in a dollar, detect if the dollar is valid, give change, you know, what, and then of course you've got different items that are different prices, so you've got to figure out how much to give back. It, it gets relatively sophisticated after a while, but fundamentally, the gist or the, the, the core concept is the same. You've got a state machine. How much have you put in? What are you purchasing? How much do I have to give you back? What do we got next? Different modeling way, language. Flowcharts. Ah, I gotta love flowcharts. All right. So flowcharts are basically used to visually describe a process or an algorithm. Okay. They describe the steps in the control of a process. Now they are most definitely old school. When I uh, my very first job was with uh, Boeing Aircraft Corporation. You know, came out of school. My head was filled with all the latest and greatest. 
documentation techniques for engineering designs, uh, universal modeling language, uh, DFEs, all that sort of stuff, showed up, they were using flowcharts. And I was like, really? Flowcharts? And I mean, they had books, big, thick books of flowcharts for all the different functionality that they had. And they said, yes, we really, truly do use flowcharts. Keep your, your mouth shut, watch how we do it, and then we can talk in a couple months. And it turned out, it was actually a really good way to do it, okay? Because flowcharts are very easy to put together. If I give you a flowchart, pretty much once you understand what the symbols are, you'll very quickly be able to understand the logic behind it. Now, it was a pain in the butt to keep the flowchart updated to what the actual system was doing, right? I mean, there was a great deal of uh, personal effort to put into that. But, arguably, it was an effective technique. Um, they are old-fashioned. Uh, they're, why use a flowchart? Well, first off, they're easy to recognize. Uh, they're easy to understand. Uh, learning how to create a flowchart, I mean, it doesn't really take a college degree, now does it? Okay, we've got, what, maybe uh, six or eight symbols over there. Poof, you have those down, you can pretty much create a flowchart. Uh, and in fact, people apply flowcharts to a lot of different situations, to engineering designs, of course, but they also apply them to things like business processes. So let's see a flowchart in action, shall we? Boop, there we go. All right. So this is an example, we're talking about an embedded computer system that's going to monitor the light level of an environment. It's actually pretty straightforward stuff, so flowchart makes it very intuitive to understand what's going on. So we start here, we go ahead and we sample the light strength, we store the sample value into an array. All right, that's all pretty good stuff. Then we hit one of these things, Boop. compute light sample average. You see it has the little level bars on the side? In the world of software, this is a subroutine. In the world of flowcharts, this calls another flowchart. Okay, there's some other class, goes off, does some stuff, brings some information back. Boop. Our wait time is about a millisecond. Here we display the average value. We check to see if the users press the key. If so, we come back, do it all over again. If not, we're done. So, you know, you guys haven't taken any courses on flowcharts, you haven't read any big, thick books on it, and yet that was hopefully fairly intuitive as far as what was going on. All right? So, flowcharts are pretty good. Uh, in the complete system description, there'd be a second flowchart. That's exactly what we're talking about there. That would describe how the system determines the average values of the light samples. Uh, it's very intuitive. It's a small issue, but if you're actually documenting something with flowcharts, you probably want to limit the number of blocks on a given page to somewhere between probably about 10 to 20 blocks. You can pack more blocks onto a sheet of paper, but if you do that, all of a sudden it becomes very difficult to keep track of what's going on. I've seen upwards of 60 blocks packed onto a single sheet of paper, but at that point in time you hit a density issue that makes it very challenging. Uh, a couple of drawbacks to using flowcharts. And the first one is, is that they don't represent the structure of the data being manipulated. Up here, compute light sample average. So what does that sample average look like? Is it an integer? You know, is it a real number? Is it an array of values? Who knows? Flowchart isn't really set up to tell you what the data looks like. It can tell you the data's there, but it can't really tell you what it looks like. And they're not really terribly good at talking about things that are going on at the same time. Concurrent processes, flowchart doesn't really have any concept of that. It starts, it does, it ends, and that's its entire world. If you've got multiple things going on at the same time, a flowchart isn't really your best way of representing that. But, you know, for an awful lot of things out there, flowcharts will do just fine. All right. Oh, my goodness. Even more modeling languages. How much would you pay now? This is fantastic. Uh, DFDs, or data flow diagrams. It's sort of a different approach. You're not really trying to model the whole system at this point in time. What you're really trying to do is just model the processing and flow of data. Okay? So you've gone to sort of a higher level of abstraction. I'm not going to worry about a lot of stuff, but I want to know what data the system has. I want to know where it's going, and I want to know what's happening to the data. And depending on what type of system you're doing, for example, if you're doing an information system or something like that, that's exactly what you're interested in. It's a functional uh, oriented approach. Uh, DFDs are actually fairly sim similar to functional decomposition, which we talked about in our last class. So they accept an input, they do a transformation on the data they get, and then they produce an output. Uh, but it's a little bit different from functional decomposition in so much that uh, you do functional decomposition. Remember, you started at a high level, and you went all the way down until you had something that actually sort of looked 
like what your final product is going to be. A DFD doesn't care about your final product. Once again, a DFD only cares about the fact that you're uh, modeling the data. Okay? Uh, there are four symbols used in when you're creating a DFD. The first one is a process. A process basically describes a useful task or function, which is very similar to what we saw in the state diagram. The next one is a data flow. Uh, it represents a data relationship between two processes. So if you're in a process, some data happens, you end up in another process. Data stores, talks about exactly what you would just, oh, exactly, there we go. Exactly what you'd expect. It's basically sort of a database. It's a place to place and store the data. And then the final thing that we have is an interface, which is where uh, inter external agents that use the systems uh, also referred to as sources and sinks in the world of DFDs. All right. So let's take a look at an actual DFD and see if we can figure out what's going on. So this is actually a DFD for a uh, video browsing system. If you've never spent that much time working with video, video systems generally suck. Basically, primarily because video is huge, it's gigantic. If you try to do anything with it, it's slow, it's awkward, it's difficult to get around. Um, it may be pretty cumbersome to preview videos and to extract the important information. So what's the solution? The solution is to slim down the database, the video database, as much as you possibly can. What they like to do is actually take a look at the video. They take a look at a stretch of video, pick out what they call keyframes, which is basically a single image that shows what's going on in that. Like if it's a football game, you can tell who's got the ball, where they, what, uh, what line of the field they're on, stuff like that. Chops it off and says it starts here and it ends here, and then you place that in a much smaller database, uh, basically a uh, annotation database. And you could quickly go into the annotation database, say, hey, that's the piece of video I'm interested in, and then you can go back up to the big video ba uh, database and pull out the chunk that you want to do. It allows you to do two things a lot quicker. Um, so how would this actually work here? So this would be our video database. This is where we're storing all of the video. Okay? And the DMV shows what's going on here. Basically, you take all the video, you run it through your shot boundary detection processes, which is basically saying, when does it, a scene start? When does it end? In football, it would be potentially a play. Right? Okay? From that, it picks out the boundaries, and it picks out the keyframes, and places it into the annotation database, which is, of course, a smaller database of the video images that you have. So once again, this is a data store in the uh, DFD. Then you have your user over here who's making a browse request, storyboard preview, which once again gives you the, just the little samples of what's going on. And it's going to pull that from the annotation database. It's going to get keyframes, and it's going to get the boundaries of where those are located. It's going to provide it as a storyboard to the user. The user goes cycling through for potentially the plays of a football game and says, hey, that's the play that I'm actually interested in. So then they go ahead and they reach out here and they say it's a shot preview request. Shot preview goes back to the actual video database, pulls the video, and then actually gives the shot to the user. That's all there is to it. Okay? So once again, it's just a different way of model. In this particular case, it's a user interacting with a database that you created a sub-database for. And it's a data flow diagram. Any questions there? Yeah. How come it looks like a flowchart? It looks like a flowchart only in so much that I could draw data stores correctly. Data stores are supposed to have their right most box missing. That's the only thing that's missing from this particular one. It just wasn't graphically possible to do it. So our, we have two data stores, right? So that one should be missing that particular box, and that one should be there. They look very similar, but they're not. Does that make sense? Uh, and the difference is, on a flow chart, you're dealing with control. And the difference on a DFD, all you're dealing with is actually the flow of the data itself. That's all you care about. All right. Important points regarding uh, the BFDs. Uh, they basically specify the behavior based, once again, specifically on the flow of data throughout the design. Specific information on the data flows is actually defined as something called a data dictionary, which you can spend an awful lot of time talking about and we're not going to do. In our example, there was no implied sequencing between the, when the shot boundary detection process right here was being run and when the user was actually making their request. We didn't talk about when those were actually occurring because you would think that those, you'd have to do this part first so that you have this database before the user could actually make their request. Let us assume that they can run it currently and that's exactly what a DFD says. Yeah. 
Um, build that data before you can do anything with it. All right. So DFTs are one type of modeling. Let's keep going on. There's another type here. Woo. Entity relationship diagrams, uh, or ERDs. Okay. The intention of an ERD is to catalog a related set of objects, which we like to call entities, their attributes and the relationships between them. Okay. Entities and the relationships are real distinct things. They have characteristics that need to be captured. Entities need to be related to each other in order to be able to ask meaningful questions about the data. Now there's three elements that we use in the ERD modeling language, entities, relationships, and attributes. Now entities are tangible objects. They are things like roles played, organizational units, devices, locations. Um, it's a little bit more complicated, but basically the instance is a manifestation of a particular entity. So if an entity was books, then a particular book would be considered to be a, uh, me uh, an instance of relationships, which is down here. Uh, there are descriptors for the relationships between entities in an entity relationship diagram. And then finally, attributes or features that are used to differentiate between different instances of the entities, which is all a fabulous bunch of words. But perhaps an example would make it a little bit clearer. All right. When you're going to actually create an entity relationship, the very first thing you need to do is actually keep, create what's called an entity relationship matrix with, with, and with a little bit of luck, this will look very familiar to you because we've done these before, right? So the column headers are, we'll go ahead and use a university example. So if we have a university or a college that wants to store information about students, courses, and departments, you create your column headers, student, course, department, you make your rows, student, course, department. So let's talk about the relationship between students the courses and the departments at often. So a student takes many courses, a student majors in one particular department. That all seems pretty realistic, right? A course has many students, a course can require many other courses, and it can also be a prerequisite for many courses, and a course is offered by one department. Okay, and the last one down here is a department enrolls many students, and a department offers many courses. So what you're starting to see here is you're starting to see the three components that you have, which is students, courses, and departments. We're starting to map out the relationships between them because when we're doing our modeling, that's what we're actually very interested in. Is this used just for databases or is it for something? It's primarily for databases, yes. We have a quantity of information. What you really want to do is you want to have a modeling language that captures the relationship between the data that you're going to be storing, right? So although we're talking about in terms of a database, you could also have an electronic system that's trying to store a deal of sample data, for example, right? So this is a college example, but you can make it anything you want. Uh, relationships are bidirectional uh, because they have two participating entities. Uh, there's something else going on here. It's called a cardinality rule. And then basically, you can see it here. So student to course is a uh, many to many. So many students take many courses, right? Remember, we talked about that mapping stuff, right? There's one to one, one to many, many to many. This is a many to many type of thing. And then there's a student to department right here. And that's a many to one type of relationship, right? There's a whole bunch of students associated with the electrical engineering program. There you go. All right. So after you've gone through the effort of creating your entity relationship matrix, the next thing that you want to do is actually create a diagram. Here we go. All right. Yet another way of representing a design. So let's see what we actually have here. We have actually three things here. So we've got our student, we've got our department, and then we also have our course. And then we've got a lot of mappings going on here. So our diamond-shaped symbols are actually showing uh, the relationships between, for example, in this case, a student and a course. The M indicates that it's a, uh, a many relationship. A one obviously indicates the cardinality on that is a one. Okay. So I have a student associated with one particular department. A student majors in a department. A department enrolls the student. Okay. These are actually considered to be attributes. So social security, social security number, name, date of birth, age, GPA, major, all that sort of stuff. Is really in there. Okay. Attributes are associated with each entity. An attribute can be a, is a feature or a characteristic of that entity that has to be remembered. Uh, if you go to all of this effort, Mapping out all the relationships, in this case, between students and courses and departments and all that sort of stuff like that. 
the value to you is the fact that you could actually plop this into a piece of software and it'll actually generate a database for you. It'll actually lay it out, it'll map it out, and have all the relationships in it. So actually going to the effort to document your design as an entity relationship gives you a chance to actually be able to just plug and chug and poof, you've got a database that shows up that will accurately reflect your design. You make a mistake, it'll actually accurately reflect your mistake. Are there any questions? All right. All right, I think this is the last one that I wanted to cover. Um, this is a unified modeling language. This, I was really sure about going over this one, but I figured I'd include it just because it's actually very popular. You'll see UML all over the place, okay? I see it more often in the world of computer science because it has a lot to do with object-oriented programming and stuff like that. But it's probably worth having at least a quick discussion about it. What it is, it's actually a notation, and there's a whole bunch of different views of a problem that you can have. This is one particular view. This is a static view of a problem, okay? Uh, in this particular case, we're trying to put together a, a virtual brochure. And if you're going to do something like that, what would you actually need to be able to model? You'd obviously need to have a customer. You need to have a, a delivery, something that you're going to drop off to that customer. They'd have to be placing an order, and the order would have to be consist of a whole series of items, grocery items, you would think. Now, when you have an item and you have an order, then all of a sudden that creates a grocery cart. You've got to be able to have some place to store that stuff. So these are all related to each other. You can also see that uh, a star, an after means like a many, uh, many to one relationship, and a one means it's a one to one relationship. So one customer gets one particular delivery. There could be a whole bunch of deliveries that go to a whole bunch of different customers. Uh, there's some other things such as the functionality, sent by, contained, part of, all that sort of stuff like that. You can lose yourself in UML. Okay? There's books and books that are written on it. It's actually a very, very um, highly respected particular modeling language. I see it more used in the world of software, necessarily, but you can also use it to describe hardware systems. So it really comes down to whatever the preference is for the folks that you're working with. Well, it's an easy way to learn it, because I've come across it and tried to recourse on it. And it's kind of it's, uh, you got you to dive in, right? Uh, Easiest way to you know, learn is probably to use it, right? Um, I'm trying to think, there's a lot, of, it's associated with Java a great deal, right? I mean, primarily because Java is an object-oriented language that you can, where you can map it into it. So probably creating it and then mapping it into it would probably be the easiest way to do it. There are tools that take it from a UML description and actually produce code, and that might actually be one of the clearer ways that's actually going to make it straightforward. All right, are there any questions about UML? All right, that was an awful lot of information to cover in a fairly short period of time. The gist or the takeaway that I want you guys to have here is to understand that when you create a design, in order to <coughs> communicate your design to other people, you're going to have to be able to document it. Okay? And there is no silver bullet. There is no one way to document an engineering design. Instead, there's a whole bunch of different ways. And all the ways are great ways to do it, but you need to make a, a call. You need to understand what your design is, and you need to figure out which one of these approaches is the best approach for your particular design. Okay? And it may actually turn out that it's a combination. It may be flowcharts and DFDs, or flowcharts and state diagrams, or what have you. But ultimately, that's your call. So where do we go now? Ooh. Shall we talk about your capstone project? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Because I have a gift for you. I have an assignment. How cool is that? All right, so what have we gotten accomplished? All right, so we did a pick the project uh, many times, perhaps. We've determined your problem statement for your capstone. Excellent, that's fabulous. We've written a description of your project. That's fantastic. Hopefully, today you turned in an objective tree. I say big pile there, so I think that's great stuff. Where are we now? Ooh, pick a faculty mentor. Now, why are we doing this now? Did we send you an email already? I don't think you did. We wrote one. We were running. You wrote one. Mm -hmm. So you're all squared. You're locked and loaded. This should be pretty easy to do, right? But I want you to take it to the next level. The email would be a good start. Well, actually, I guess the email was probably a part of your description, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So email, fabulous. I didn't ask, actually ask you to do it. I just produced it, and that's fine. Okay. What I want you to do is I want you to find somebody who's willing to work with you as a mentor. Now, there's two people in the class that have already done it. Who's already done the capstone? All right, I haven't done you get you get a pass. All right. So here's just so what's this going to look like? 
It's going to look like this. I'm actually, I've already uploaded this to Dashboard. I apologize. I think I have to make two changes to it. <laughs> but uh, this is your Capstone Faculty Mentor Selection Form. Okay. You're doing an interview. You're doing an interview of, the, uh, of a USF electrical engineering faculty member. And by the way, they've already got a heads up that you're coming because there's a lot more of you than there are of them, okay? Okay. I want you to talk to three of them. I want you to have a face-to-face -face discussion with three electrical engineering faculty members. Okay, it probably is not going to last that long. 10, 15 minutes is probably all this is actually going to take. Okay? I want you to have a chance to sit down and describe your project to them. Okay? And what I want you to do is I want you to collect a whole bunch of interesting information. Now this is 11 questions that I came up with. You may come up with different questions, that's perfectly okay. You may come up with 20 questions, I don't care. Okay? Pick whatever works best for you. But I want you to basically capture how that interaction with the faculty member goes. So how are we supposed to choose a, a mentor if we don't have our project kind of decided on what we want to do? All right, so let's go back to this. In theory, you've done four things. Now, you may have changed your idea, which is perfectly okay. But no matter what, you just created an objective tree, right? Tell me you just created an objective tree. Okay, excellent. So, so you at least have that, right? Potentially, you are, now did you say that keep the one, is your description of the same project? It could change before next semester. It certainly could, and that's fine too. No, I mean, we're, we're choosing a faculty member based on something that we don't know about. You're going to go have a talk with a faculty member. Okay, and that faculty member, so here's the scoop. You're actually going to have a talk with three faculty members, right? So what's actually going to happen here? If you're going to talk to three faculty members, let's, let's whip out that uh, magic seize the future globe and take a look into it. How's that actually going to go for you? Would you like to know? <laughs> All right, one of those faculty members is it's going to be a bad interaction. Okay? You're going to hit them on a bad day. They're not going to like you because they remember you from class and you were always a, you were always a troublemaker. Or they just don't like your topic. It just doesn't do anything for them. I don't know what the story is. Hopefully they'll treat you politely. <laughs> Maybe they won't. Who knows? But that interaction isn't going to go well. How's the other one going to go? Well, the other one that you're going to interact with, it's going to go okay. I mean, you can't actually say it's going to go badly, but they're not, they're not really going to seem all that interested. Yeah, they were nice, and they met with you, and you had a discussion. But it just didn't quite seem to like grab, right? And then the other person that you meet with, well, okay, there was something there. You know, you had a good interaction with them. It actually went pretty well. They expressed some interest in your idea, but they had some suggestions. They said, ah, you know, I don't think it's enough for a capstone, or I see where you're going, but, you know, that's not really my interest. Would you consider doing something along the lines of this? Because this is more along my lines, right? Uh, that, if I had to take a guess, that's how I'm going to anticipate your interaction with the three faculty members is going to go. Okay, is it going to go that way? I have no idea. Got a question in the back? If, uh, if I've already gotten a mentor to help with the capstone. I'm sorry, hang on. Just too much background noise. What's up? If I've already got a mentor and advisor to help with the capstone, do I need to waste the time with two more faculty members? or can I? You know, I want you to, yeah. Okay, now admittedly, now you already have one, right? Did you get the right one? You sure? How do you know? Because he likes me. He says I'm special. Talk with the other two. I'll tell you what, talking with the other two will confirm that you have the right one. That's not like a good idea? I mean, like when you're dating somebody, don't you date other people to make sure that you're oh, well, maybe, maybe <laughs> 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 Of course I say That's that's yeah. I've been watching that sister wives program. <laughs> you have, have a question here. <laughs> we'll stop. Hopefully it's by the fifteenth. Okay. I actually went back and forth on that date because unfortunately I had to crank it out by next week and it turns out that was just a bad, bad, bad idea. I think you've got two weeks to get this one accomplished if I have my dates here correct, okay? Because once again, there's a lot of you and there's not a lot of them, okay? So once again, you're gonna, so you're going to reach out. You're going to, you know, potentially you have an email you can send to them and say, hey, listen, I'm getting ready for this. Would you have some time to meet with me? And you're going to find out right off the bat whether or not they have time to meet with you. If they don't have time to meet with you, consider that to be a clue. 
Now here's an interesting question I have for you. What happens if you meet with three faculty members and they all go badly? <laughs> well, you know, that's You will have fantastic information if that happens. Because if it goes badly, you've got a question that you need to come up with an answer to. Why did it go badly? Okay? Is it because your project is just a really lousy project for this particular collection of faculty? Right? Or did you just choose the wrong three? Okay, if it goes badly with all three, then you have to figure out what your next step is. Your next step might be, go talk to three more. Okay? <laughs> By the way, if it goes badly with those three, you've had a very, very clear indication that your project's not really the best project. But, I'm going to ask that when you're talking with these three, they are all going to give you feedback. Because they, they're professors, they, they can't stop it, right? And they're going to tell you what they think of your project. And if they say your baby's ugly, Write it down, okay? Because there's a reason that they're saying it. You may disagree with them, that's completely okay. But do me a favor and note it. Write down what they don't like about your project, and then ask them a question. Hey, you know, I understand you do, so you don't think it's What would I have to do to change it to make it an acceptable project? Get that input from them, okay? And you, once again, you may not agree with it, but collect it. And by the way, if you've got two professors telling you the same thing, all of a sudden it starts to have a little bit more weight, right? One professor might be having a bad day, or maybe everything has to have lasers if he's going to work on it, right? I'm sorry, my, my, my uh, solar solution doesn't have a laser in it, right? Whatever, okay? Some of it you have to throw out, but collect that information. If they say they don't like your project, if they say that they don't think it's up to, you know, up to snuff, Ask them what would need to be changed to make it a good project and collect that information. Okay? Cool. Questions? Any questions on this? Got two weeks to pull this one off. Is that all good? So, what, what's going on with each other? Checkmark? I agree with you. You know, and I apologize. I, I probably need to go a little clearer. What I'm actually looking for you to do is score it. Numbers. Yeah, make up, and, and the number can be whatever you want, 1 to 100, 1 to 10, 1 could be better than 10, 10 could be better than 1, and what I'm going to want you to do is to total it up, right? What I'm looking for you to do is for you to pick which faculty member you would prefer to work with. Now remember, just because you pick them doesn't mean they're going to pick you, right? But let's, let's, you're in the driver's seat, okay? You're interviewing them, and you want to find out if they would be a good match for you, step one, and for your project, step two. Mr. Um, let's just say you're an awesome communicator and um, you go on to meet with your first mentor. He likes your project. You like him. And uh, he says, work with you. Do you need to continue on and interview some more? The answer is yes. Okay. So say you were out and you were right. dating yeah, and you bumped into a person that seemed to be the best person that you wanted to spend the rest yeah, of your life with. Area. Would you go ahead and date other people to make sure? <laughs> no. You know what I mean, though. <laughs> <laughs> Talking in the Amish community is always difficult here, but yes. <laughs> the concept is, is, so you think they're the right person, but you can't prove it, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you got a good feeling, you clicked, you, you like the same stuff, you watch the same TV shows, it says this is the best project I've ever seen. Great. Go see the other two and confirm that your initial belief was correct. Who knows? You might bump into another one that's even better, right? Because you're a great communicator. <laughs> you don't have to. Right? You know, once again, the concept is just you're basically interviewing them. Okay, you're trying to feel and find out if there's a match. Okay, if you want to you make a commitment to do that, you're more than welcome to have asked and talk to Alright? Wait, we got one in the back. Uh could you have like two sponsors? Maybe some more together. You could. First off, yeah, go for it, not a problem whatsoever. Your life is going to get more complicated if you do that, right? Because who's in charge? If one tells you to, to make it red and the other one tells you to make it blue, what are you going to do? So yeah, you can. Okay? Just life gets a little bit more complicated if you do that. By the way, just in case you're missing a little subtlety here, if any of you choose to go on to graduate school, yeah. As we like to say, hide out in college for a little while longer. You will need to have 
right? A thesis advisor. Arguably, you do the same damn thing, right? You know, you pick a thesis advisor, right? Or if you want to offer a PhD, you'd have to have a dissertation advisor. You'd want to do the same sort of thing. You wouldn't really just want to show up and say, oh, hey, by the way, would you be willing to work with me or something like that? You'd really want to make sure that they were the right person for you. So that's what we're trying to do here. Remember, for the first time in a long time in college, you're in the driver's seat, right? You're doing the interviewing, you're having the talk, you're evaluating whether or not you think that you can work with this person because ultimately the capstone grade is yours. You pick the right person, you're going to get the grade you want to have. You pick the wrong person, that grade's going to be a pain in the butt. Right? You know, one thing I forgot to put on here is maybe find out how much effort they think the capstone should be. Right? How many hours per week would they expect you to be putting in on the capstone? Would that be something important to find out? Because if they think you're a slacker, you're not putting in enough effort, they're going to have a negative impression of you, right? Yeah. Maybe a half an hour a week is all you have to do. But you want to make sure that they're comfortable with that. All right. So that's it. By the way, this uh, form is up on the dashboard system. I'll be making an update later on today. I think I'm going to add, I'd like to know the names of the professors that you talk to. And then I think on the bottom I'll put something as a proposal. Just so you can uh, get a, a clear understanding of what you're doing. Pick one. That's what we're trying to do. Are you going to submit this as a word file? It is actually a word file. So it is on dashboard. It is on the word file. With the thought being that you can change anything you want to do. Okay? Any questions? Any questions? And then this will be what this this actually here is what you'll be turning in on the 15th. Okay? Yeah. Well, if you like that assignment, you'll really like this one. Here we go. What? Oh yeah, you thought that ethics stuff was just for fun. Well, no. Actually, now this is actually a very important uh, part of the electrical engineering certification program. Uh, you got to crank out an essay, which sounds really scary, but it's not, because you have all the knowledge. So on the uh, Blackboard system, I've uploaded a scenario called All in the Family. So here's your assignment. You need to create an essay discussing the ethical issues presented by this problem. Okay? What I want you to do is I want you to turn in a double space typed written pages. It has to, here you go, because I know this is the question. How long does it have to be? <laughs> well, chapter one should focus, no, okay, here we go. It has to be long enough to fully cover the topic, but short enough to be judged as being concise. So, it had better not be short enough that it looks like you did it maybe on the morning before you turned in. Okay? And if you think you're going to impress me by writing a voluminous text, please understand that I work in marketing these days. So I know what it's like to produce a voluminous text with little or no content. So I will see through that in a heartbeat, and I have to grade the thing. So if you're going to make me work through page after page of nothingness, I will be sad and upset by the time I come to the end, and I always do the grade at the end of reading it. So that might not actually be the best overall strategy, but it's your call. Okay? Okay, you must apply the five steps of the th ethical decision-making that have been covered in class to this problem. There you go. Hey, look, guys, five steps, five paragraphs. Introduction, ending paragraph, we're up to seven paragraphs. Your thing has almost written itself, hasn't it? How cool is that? So awesome. Okay. You must, must reach a conclusion about how you would act in this case and explain why you made that decision. So talking about it without coming to a conclusion doesn't do me any good. It doesn't do you any good. Okay. So come to a decision and tell me what it is and why you reached it. Here we go. Here's the assignment. A hard copy of your essay is due to be turned in during class on November 10th. Question in the back. Is there a right or wrong answer to the problem? There is! But I'm not going to tell you what it is. And if you go the unethical way, do you fail the course? Completely and totally. <laughs> if I even get a hint that you were thinking about the wrong one, I just I shred it right there. <laughs> Come on now. We've been talking about these ethical decision making ones all semester, right? So this is not black, this is not white, right? We're somewhere in gray land at this particular point in time. So the interesting thing is, is that the answer is both yes and no. Ultimately, it's going to be up for you to describe how you view it. Okay, I've given you a framework for evaluating these things. Run through the framework and see what comes out on the other end. All right? 
And if you get the wrong answer, I'll fail you. And we'll go, no, 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 that's not. All right. Any questions about this particular assignment? Once again, the actual document is already up on the dashboard system. You should be good to go with that. <laughs> questions, questions, questions? All right. So all these dates are getting a little confusing for me, so let's see if we can make sure that we're all on the same page here. Woo. Here we go. All right, what do we got going on in this class? Because, of course, this is the only class that counts, right? Oh, good doc. That's the right answer. All right, so next week on Tuesday and Thursday, we have our exciting in-class presentation of your multi-part team project part four. Yeah, no. Because you already got the paper bag of fun supplies. And I know you're working on that already, right? Right? No. No. Oh, rock it off, rock it off. All right, so the next thing that's due is next, is the Thursday after that, your ethics essay is due in class. Okay? And then the Tuesday after that, your capsule mentor worksheet is due in class. Okay, I just want to make sure everybody's got the same mental impression of what's going on here too. So you got stuff due, but you also have a fair amount of time to get this all taken care of as long as you plan ahead. Okay? Any questions about these three activities that you have going on for this particular class? Going once, going twice, sold. Fully happy, satisfied. So, Mr. O'Brien, that was sort of we're gonna. Yeah, Can we just push the deadline like three weeks for everything? <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> not. But I appreciate yes. Because you guys already <laughs> wigged up when we were talking about that whole the final exam thing. You're like, I don't know, Dr. Anderson. I know. Maybe, maybe some of my other professors are more important than you. Dr. Anderson. <laughs> 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 That's great. You get two out of the way. Mr. O'Brien. Uh, I saw the slides from last class that we were talking about the final exam. Yes, I was. What was the verdict on that? Mr. O'Brien, it's interesting that you should bring that up. And unfortunately, I don't actually have a little slide here. So we are currently scheduled to have the final exam in this class on December, let's call it 6th, it was like Tuesday, Tuesday yeah. from 7.30 to 9.30 in this room. That's a two-hour final exam. Do you know how many problems could be fit onto a test that you have two hours? Because you had 21 questions on the one that you only had like an hour and I don't hours care. to do. I don't care. Just because we have two hours. Oh God, yes, we have to fill. Yes, we do. I, I there's in the like, professor rule book. They say, do you really want to break two hours worth of problems? Yes. <laughs> when I was getting my undergraduate degree in sadism, they said, hey, or. Or the alternative was that we could have our final exam in class on the final Thursday, during which I would be restricted to only the standard class period to give you a test, which would limit the number of questions I could possibly ask. And when I presented that to the class, there was an uproar, a virtual uproar, in which everyone said, well, I don't know. Because I might have other stuff going on that not, week. Not everybody. I might prefer to take the full two-hour final exam that starts at 7.30 in the morning, because I'm fresher in the morning, is what they were saying. I vote Thursday. I'm just saying. saying. Should, we, should we take it to a vote? Yes. 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 I'll tell you what, you know, it's a democratic society for now, at least. So let's, let's take it to a vote, OK? So we're going to do it this way. So the, it's really, it's either. Wait, wait. You, oh, I'm sorry, please. Can I? Can we vote to vote a later day? Because I'm not sure what yeah, that's fine. See, see, yeah. see, see, this is exactly the kind of weird yeah. stuff we got going on. We're just around the bush. Yeah. 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 Please, yeah. 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 We did actually agree that we're going to wait. So, uh, is that what you still want to do? You did wait for it. Still hours. want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. O'Brien, apparently the rest of the class is unwilling or unable to make a commitment, right. which, you know, from a marriage point of view, looks very bad. <laughs> it, it's still out there. Yes, uh, question. Yes. 
like there are holidays for you. I believe that you get. Uh, yeah. Is that what that is? Is that what the eleventh is? Cool. We get that off. Better day. And this class, I only get one thing on the off before on Thanksgiving. A uh, question from Mr. Brian in the back. If we're going to vote on multiple things, can we vote on not taking a final exam? Uh, yeah, you could, but I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's fine. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, any, any questions? So you got uh, three things that are coming due next week. Oh, Is this a hey, please note, and just a small one, I actually cleaned this up a little bit. So uh, Tuesday and Thursday of next week, I'm actually going to provide the testing setup. <coughs> I will bring the mine shaft. I will bring the nuclear, leaking nuclear uh, waste thing. I will bring the frozen tundra, I guess. What else am I bringing? Oh, I'll bring the, uh, I'll bring the wall. For for the uh, liquid waste, <laughs> I may also bring the Shamu splash shield to that. <laughs> I'll have some little prone mine figures in case. Uh, we have a question in the back, please. I think as far as the, that group project goes, are we going to have time to set another class? Uh, time to do what? Set whatever. You you will. Uh, my and uh, just straight up, I hadn't anticipated that that's going to take that long. Okay, I'm anticipating that you will come up and we will do it successfully and then you will go sit down. It's just because it's a hard to move when I paper Yeah, so uh, that is a challenge, but that, I guess that needs to be part of your design, doesn't it? Is there any other questions? Hey, everybody, can you keep it down? Since we have a question. Are we going to know the actual size of the wall that we're going to bring? No, you won't. Yeah, sure. How tiny. But you have a range, right? Yeah, but it's not going to be that feet. Oh, God, no. But in the problem, I believe it's a half a foot to two feet, if I recall the problem correctly. Okay? So just make sure it works for that. We have a question here. Yeah. It sounds like what you're asking is for the room. Actually, I thought it was to get it off the ground. <laughs> Okay, it's whatever it says in the instructions. Okay, so I don't want to. I don't want to move the string without touching. Right. I was under the impression it was actually to get it off the ground. So take us from reason. Once again, let me not. I don't want to confuse you. Whatever it says in the problem. That's my recollection from it. I'll be taking a closer look at it. Okay. So just whatever the problem says, if you can meet the requirements of the problem, you're good to go. Okay. Yes. Uh, you don't have the depth of mind, do you? No. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Is it like a double-sided wall? Uh, I'm sorry. Let, let's make sure we're talking about this. We're still talking about the mind shaft, right? Okay. If you read the problem, what does it say about the mind shaft? Okay. So that's probably your first step that you want to take a look at. Okay. There's spinning blades on the side of the mine shaft as it goes down, and you need... Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Wait for all of it. I'm sorry, another question? Yeah, there's a the marble. It said none of us because he's not target. We need that project. Okay, so first off, have you looked in the package? I have. Okay. I saw the marble. Hey, so you've seen the marble. Okay, great. So we're there. So we have to, like, you know, And in the problem, it said, what about the target? That's right. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, but there's also some other requirements, right? Isn't it like a low velocity delivery? Yeah. I mean, you could just throw it off the edge of the table, but that's not really doing it, right? If it was really an oxygen tank, it would pretty much go on the bottom, right? But the cool thing is that that bag was filled with supplies. And you're an engineer. So when you look at those supplies, you said, hey, I know how I can slow the, the marbles to set, to set the speed, and I know how I can make sure I can deliver it on target, right? I mean, it's pretty obvious. Right? Question in the back. The, the mine one? Yes. Are we allowed to put helium in those balloons? No. Unless you had a helium tank in the bag that I gave you, which you did. No, you cannot. Okay. Questions? 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 This is the time. All right. Well, this is good. You're thinking about the problem. You're sweating it up. All right. So remember, our grading is going to be based on your scores to find the problem statement. We're good to go. Have a fabulous weekend. Enjoy, guys.